Story 1 It was a bright Sunday morning, the 20th of June, 1954, Father's Day. I found myself embroiled in a moment that would forever alter my perception of life and its mysteries. At the tender age of five years and six months, my family and I were amidst the serenity of nature, setting up for a picnic. It was indeed a splendid day. The air was fresh, the sky a clear blue, and the majesty of the redwood trees stood tall and proud around us. As my parents busied themselves with the preparations, my brother's curiosity was piqued by a nearby stream, something he was keen to explore. Initially, I chose to stay close to the safety and familiarity of our picnic spot. However, it wasn't long before my brother returned, bubbling with excitement to share his discovery. He mentioned something about the potential of seeing fish in the stream, or maybe even hearing a frog's melodic crooning. My father, ever so casual, gave us his blessing to venture closer to the water but sternly advised against going in, especially since we were still in our shorts. My brother acknowledged this with a nod and a gesture, an unspoken promise of obedience. Yet, the lure of adventure was too strong, and soon we found ourselves edging closer to the water. Despite the clear directive, my brother couldn't resist dipping his toes in, eventually wading further in. He assured me it was shallow and warmly inviting, an assertion I couldn't immediately refute or embrace. As he ventured deeper, a game was proposed, one that seemed innocuous at first, but swiftly spiraled into a perilous encounter. The rules were simple, submerge each other under the water until a signal was given to resurface. However, during one turn, my brother's hold seemed unnervingly firm. Panic ensnared me as I gasped for air, only to swallow water instead. In those harrowing moments, a profound realization dawned upon me. I discovered an ability to detach from my physical being, observing the unfolding events from a distance. This wasn't my first experience with astral projection. It had been a refuge in times of distress, a means to escape the inexplicable harshness from my father and the complexities of my brother's interactions with me. Floating above the scene, I watched as my struggles ceased, my body becoming still under the water's embrace. This detachment brought an eerie calmness, a peace from the physical torment I was enduring. My brother, realizing the gravity of the situation, finally released his grip, but by then, I had already embraced the serenity of disconnection. As the water filled my lungs, a stark realization washed over me. I might be on the cusp of departing this physical existence. It's not that I was certain of dying in the conventional sense, but more so that the connection to my body seemed increasingly optional, unnecessary even. There was a profound sense of detachment, a heightened awareness that transcended anything I'd ever known. I remembered past escapes into the recesses of my mind, where I'd disconnect from physical pain and retreat into a parallel dimension of sorts, one filled with spiritual camaraderie and a sense of peace. These escapes weren't new. They had been a refuge from the unwarranted outbursts of my father, a space where I could be me, unencumbered by the physical world's trials and tribulations. This time, though, as I hovered in this liminal space, the situation felt markedly different. The physical pain, the cold grasp of the stream, and even the proximity to my family faded into the background. It was as if I had ventured too close to a boundary I had never crossed before, and now there was no turning back. The decision to sever my ties with the physical realm came with an unexpected ease. There was no grand struggle, just a moment of clarity where I chose to let go, fully and finally. The sight of my brother, momentarily caught between his actions and their consequences, marked the last tether to my earthly existence. His eventual decision to distance himself from the scene, albeit driven by fear of discovery rather than remorse, was the final push I needed. I watched dispassionately as he tried to erase the evidence of what had transpired. His actions, once so impactful, now seemed distant, almost irrelevant. I found myself detached, not just from my physical form, but from the entire narrative that had defined my life until that moment. This detachment wasn't born out of apathy, but rather a profound sense of freedom. For the first time, I felt liberated from a life where I seemingly had no place, not in the eyes of my father, mother, or the brother who had led me to this precipice. The realization dawned on me that this might not have been my first ordeal with such souls. It felt like a recurring cycle of dysfunction I was now keen to break. In my newfound state, I promised myself readiness for whatever came next, should I choose to engage with the physical world again. It was a vow of preparation, a commitment to not return without clear purpose or understanding of the life I would be entering. During my near-death experience, I found myself before an entity of immense power and grace, devoid of the traditional journey through a tunnel of light or encounters with familiar faces. This entity, majestic and enveloped in a radiant aura, stood as a testament to the spiritual realm's complexity and beauty. It was a moment of awe, similar in reverence to the profound connection I'd much later feel towards my wife. 
a soul whose presence once mirrored the divine. This experience, while deeply personal, felt akin to preparing a testament, a detailed account of a journey through life and beyond, meant to serve as a guide for navigating the intricacies of existence, both physical and spiritual. It was a reminder of the boundless nature of our souls, the endless possibilities that lie beyond our earthly constraints, and the profound connections that transcend our understanding of time and space. This story was shared by Larry M. and happened on June 20th in 1954. Story 2. Our annual journey to South Florida had begun, with this year's adventure taking us to Key West alongside our dearest friends. The plan was a leisurely stay, first in Fort Lauderdale for roughly a week, and then on to Key West for four days of joy and exploration. Our travels usually brought us immense pleasure, and this year was no exception. We left from their flat, it must have been a Wednesday, I recall, as we were all eager to catch the NCAA men's tournament games the following day. Upon reaching our temporary home in Key West, my friend's husband and I decided to enjoy a quick swim while our wives relaxed with drinks inside. The evening promised further enjoyment as we prepared to explore the local nightlife. After freshening up and changing, I paused for a beer, my friend opting for a cocktail, just as our wives joined us from the balcony. I was about to step out when I suddenly felt myself tumble forward though I can hardly say I felt the fall. Instead, I found myself inexplicably outside my own body, floating two stories high, a silent observer to the unfolding scene below. Looking back, my actual departure from life seemed delayed until after the emergency responders had arrived, thanks to the immediate CPR efforts of my friend's wife. At this point in my life, I was in peak physical condition, a detail I mentioned not out of vanity, but to highlight my physical presence and the absurdity I felt watching the responders navigate the tight stairwell with my sizable self. Floating there, I noticed a crowd gathered, their faces clear and distinct. One young lad with dark hair seemed to lock eyes with me, before I was suddenly propelled at an extraordinary speed through a tunnel of vibrant, kaleidoscopic colors, reminiscent of a Star Wars hyperdrive sequence. In this place, time lost all meaning. A second stretched into eternity and vice versa. As I slowed, I encountered an indescribably luminous orb, feeling a comforting presence assure me that all was well. The serenity and heightened awareness I experienced is beyond words. A review of my life ensued, not as discrete events but as a singular all-encompassing moment, stirring within me feelings of euphoria, laughter and sadness all at once. A profound realization was imparted upon me. The paramount importance of love, for fellow humans, the earth, and all its creatures. This interconnectedness I was shown spans beyond our understanding of time and existence. After receiving insights into love, connectedness, and our eternal nature, I knew it was time to return. My consciousness was next aware in the Key West Regional Hospital, my first concern humorously being the state of my beard, altered for an oxygen mask. Recovery was gradual, with my mental clarity returning slowly over days. Despite not remembering the experience initially, the aftermath has been a journey of deep emotional and spiritual reflection marked by PTSD, but also a profound sense of compassion and love. The knowledge gained from this experience remains invaluable, reshaping my understanding of life and existence. This story was shared by Steve D. and happened on March 13th in 2008. Story 3 As I sat in the hospital emergency department, a wave of dizziness swept over me. The room spun, and I stumbled towards the reception desk. Before I could utter a word, darkness enveloped me, and I drifted into unconsciousness. When I came to, I found myself lying on a gurney, being wheeled into a room. But what struck me more than the clinical surroundings was the ethereal glow bathing everything. It's hard to put into words, but it was like being immersed in light, a light that seemed to emanate warmth and peace. Despite the surrealness of the situation, I felt oddly serene and aware of my surroundings. There was no fear, no panic, only an overwhelming sense of contentment. It was as if I was engaged in a silent conversation. A conversation conducted not through words but through thoughts and emotions. Later it was suggested to me that the presence I felt might have been my daughter, who had passed away tragically just months before. While I can't be certain, the thought resonated with me, though it wasn't at the forefront of my mind during the experience. I remember expressing a desire to stay in that moment forever, but a gentle reassurance came, reminding me of my responsibilities to my wife and son. It was as though I was being told that my time hadn't come yet, that there was still much for me to do. Although the encounter lasted only a few minutes, the profound happiness it left me with lingered for hours. It was a happiness unlike any I had experienced before, a deep-seated certainty that surpassed any doubts I had about what lies beyond this life. Reflecting on it later, 
I realized that my understanding of death had shifted. No longer did I view it with apprehension or uncertainty. Instead, I embraced it with a newfound sense of peace, knowing that my consciousness, my essence, would endure beyond the confines of my physical body. While some may label my experience as a near-death experience, I hesitate to categorize it as such. True, my condition was serious, but I never felt on the brink of death. Nevertheless, whatever it was, it left a profound mark on me, reaffirming my belief in the continuity of life beyond this earthly existence. This story was shared by James B. and happened in 2022. Story 4. The moment my sister and her friend chose to exclude me from the treehouse in such a dramatic fashion, my life took an unexpected turn. As the trapdoor made contact, I found myself dislodged from the ladder. Yet curiously, I didn't feel the fall. Instead, I was suddenly back at the top of the ladder, observing my own body below in a way that defied all logic. Peering down, I saw myself lying there, motionless, while everything around me seemed lighter, almost ethereal. The world had taken on a different hue. People and objects alike were enveloped in soft glows. The scene below me unfolded in silence, despite the clear panic and chaos. My parents were beside themselves and the others present seemed frozen in shock. From my peculiar vantage point, I watched as my body was carried into the house and laid on my parents' bed. Then, as someone checked my spine, darkness took over, and I awoke to significant pain, marking the beginning of a lifelong struggle with my back and neck. This experience, void of celestial beings, tunnels, or vibrant colors, introduced me to the concept of the etheric plane. At six years old, the concept of death was foreign to me. I was more intrigued by the duality of my existence than scared. Floating above, disconnected from my body, I felt an incredible lightness and peace. Years later, armed with knowledge from theosophy and occultism, I attempted astral projection. On the seventh day of a ritual, I found myself once again on the etheric plane, surrounded by the familiar glow but without the expected spectral inhabitants. The tranquility was profound, yet as I contemplated exploring further, concern over alarming my friend halted me. Suddenly I was pulled back into my body, waking with a migraine, a stark contrast to the peace I had briefly reclaimed. This journey steered me towards a spiritual path, blending theosophy, a touch of occultism, and elements of Buddhism. My early experiences in the Episcopal Church, marred by hypocrisy, led me to forge my own spiritual path, resonating with the teachings of Jesus among other great spiritual guides. My approach is eclectic, somewhere between New Age and Bohemian, yet decidedly grounded. These experiences have shaped not just my beliefs, but my very perception of life and beyond. This story was shared by Harry W. and happened some time ago. Story 5 Seven days after being diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome, I found myself on life support in an ICU, utterly dependent on a machine to breathe. It was on the seventh day of my hospital stay that I slipped into unconsciousness, a moment that felt like the final curtain was drawing close on my life. As the world around me faded, the last thing I heard was the incessant beep of the monitor. In that space between life and whatever lies beyond, I experienced an indescribable sense of liberation. Imagine floating in a vast, boundless vacuum where the weight of the world simply doesn't exist. The peace and calm I felt were unlike anything I've ever known. It was as though I had shed every earthly tether, yet I wasn't troubled by the loss. I was as light as air, drifting in serenity. This sensation lasted for what felt like 30 seconds, but in such a state, time seemed irrelevant. During this profound moment, I distinctly heard my sister's voice calling me back. Curiously, she wasn't actually by my side in the ICU, yet her voice reached me. The staff later confirmed she wasn't physically present. Despite her pleas, part of me yearned to stay in that tranquil void. The calm was so complete, so all-encompassing. Eventually, I was drawn back to the stark reality of the ICU to the sound of beeping monitors and the sight of doctors and paramedics working over me. Their relief was palpable when I regained consciousness. Despite this and subsequent lapses into unconsciousness, I never again experienced anything quite like that first near-death experience. Months later, fully recovered from the syndrome, I returned to the hospital to express my gratitude to the medical team. Curiosity led me to ask about the cause of my near-fatal incident. The doctors speculated a possible blood clot exacerbated by the paralysis that Guillain-Barre syndrome brings. It was a sobering reminder of the fragility of life. I've kept the story of my NDE to myself, wary of disbelief or dismissal. Even after discovering a colleague with a similar experience, I hesitated to share mine. The fear of misunderstanding or rational explanations overshadowing the profound personal impact of my NDE has kept me silent. 
yet the memory of that peaceful void remains vivid, a stark contrast to the turmoil of recovery and a reminder of an experience that defies easy explanation. This story was shared by Pooja5 and happened on December 30th in 2014. Story 6. I contracted three strains of dengue fever while working in Mexico. By the time I reached a CDC-affiliated doctor in Atlanta, Georgia, my condition had worsened into meningoencephalitis. As I entered the hospital, it felt like my brain was ablaze. In the emergency room, my teeth chattered uncontrollably, rendering me unable to speak. Then something extraordinary happened. I found myself hovering up in the corner of the ceiling, observing as the doctor performed a spinal procedure. Once he finished, I swiftly returned to my body, but only momentarily, as I shot out the other side. I began drifting away into an abyss of darkness. It was remarkably tranquil, serene, and utterly silent. After a while, a disembodied voice spoke, informing me, You understand you are dying now. It felt like I was presented with a choice. I could either continue drifting away or return to my body. Knowing that Susan and my daughters were still at the border in Texas, I couldn't bear the thought of leaving without them nearby. So I made the decision to return. The sensation of drifting away ceased, and I gradually descended back, one level at a time, through the darkness. At each level I paused for a moment of respite. Eventually I reached a level where faint voices could be heard. As I descended further, light began to emerge. Finally, I regained consciousness. The medical staff bombarded me with questions, my name, whereabouts, and knowledge of the president. However, I couldn't respond. My mouth refused to form words. Throughout the following week, the fever caused profuse sweating, necessitating frequent changes of bedding. Interestingly, while many people find religion after a near-death experience, mine had the opposite effect. It led me to a place of acceptance, where I no longer crave answers to life's profound questions. I've become content to embrace the mysteries that surround us. These pictures are from my NDE. When I use a type of 3D glasses, the painted pictures appear in 3D and look like the images are floating. This story was shared by Dan R. and happened in 1991.